shit. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, please. Okay. You carry on, I'm not here. Don't worry. Hi guys, welcome back to Wild Vlogs, where we'll talk about all things wildlife and all things filmmaking. My voice, despite how it sounds, is actually improving. Hopefully next week, back to normality. Today's vlog, Vlog 11, is going to be very special because it's about a very special bird. Her name is Thelma. She's a female, or she was a female, white-tailed sea eagle. Many of you may be shocked to hear me use the past tense there for Thelma. No more shocked and horrified and disgusted than I. Before we hit that news and I, I elaborate some more, let's revisit the film about Thelma. But instead of having just the short piece at the end of the Tale of Two Eagles film that I made over a year ago, I've now gone back to the footage and I've re-edited it so it's more thorough and more detailed. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to watch this film with you directly. So you'll see the film on the main part of the screen and you'll see me in the bottom corner so I can react directly to what we're watching. I hope you enjoy. So here we are on the first part of our journey heading through the fringes of the Caledonian pine forest. I just can't tell you how excited I was on this day. Here's us arriving at the RSPB Lodge at Benethi Forest where we knew that other people, like-minded people, also heading out with us on that day, should already be there. So there's Ian, my friend, my childhood friend, with Roy Dennis, setting up some of the equipment. And now we have the second stage of our journey, the second leg. This reserve, I don't know if you know, the Abernethy Forest Reserve is an ancient forest it's virtually untouched since the Ice Age and it's massive, huge amount of area in the foothills of the Cairngorm Mountains. I was so nervous right now. This really was going to be a day where several of my dreams came true, not just one. So we got to as far as we could by road and then we had to trek on foot and that was going to be about another half a mile to a mile. In this forest, I know I've spoken to you about Abernethy recently, but it's so dense with ecology and uh, its underbelly, its floor is just full of playberry, bilberry and heather, young rowan, young birch, Caledonian pine saplings, full, it ran to the gills with life. It's an amazing place. So this walk may have been, I don't know, a half an hour. I, do you know what? I couldn't really tell you. We were just all riding on a wave of adrenaline at this point. We did arrive, and before us stood the most majestic granny pine, a 16th century granny pine. And then we handed over to this gentleman. His name is Fraser. And Fraser is a consummate tree climber. There's no tree that Fraser can't scale. Okay, heads up, especially yourself there. So 
these granite pines, they form in a very different fashion to other Caledonian pines. I think when they reach a certain age, they kind of spread out a bit more like a, an oak tree, a deciduous oak tree. And we were told that the nest here, there's some precautionary removal of branches. It's actually harder to climb this than the last one. Well, I was just thinking that because they just knock all big limbs, don't they? And the yeah. nest here was right in the canopy of this tree in a well formed by the uppermost branches. Cute. Reliably told by Fraser, this wasn't an easy tree to climb. And you could cut the atmosphere with a knife right now. So Fraser now I believe called up, there it is, called up the uh, the sports bag, the hold all, the trusty hold all, and this is where the uh, the birds will be transported in and out of this hold all via this pulley system. I'm almost as tense right now watching this as I was then. Ah, there's Roy Dennis. He's an amazing man, an amazing conservationist. And now we have Fraser right at the canopy. I remember I had to step away from the tree to get this shot. And you can see him positioning himself. And you watch his eyes. It's been very, ah, and there look wings. Huge wings. So we knew that he'd reached the spot. And then he called down, I love this, but he called down to Ian and Roy. Both massive. Oh, right, okay. Both they massive. Were. This one's a feisty one, the other one just sat down. Okay. So it's hard to judge, but this one was definitely... So apparently there's um, a relaxed one, and there's a bit more of a feisty one. And we're receiving the feisty one first. It was just a bit too much to bear at this point, I can tell you. I don't know how I was holding the camera still. Look at this. Ellie, would you like to be scribe? Oh. oh. Well, that's a big bird. It's got a tick in its mouth, Roy. What? Got a tick in its mouth. Has it? What an incredible thing to behold. And she is only eight weeks old. So on with these bespoke leather hoods. Hopefully to placate her a little. But these apex predators they don't tend to show much nerves. They did to settle quite quickly. Against the clock. Everything is against the clock from now on. As soon as the birds come down. And I know that Louise, Thelma's sister, followed straight away. But immediately the job must start. And the initial job is to get a ring on this bird. And these rings obviously have a unique identifier. There's the geotag in the foreground. This is what's coming up next. That's the important piece of equipment. So here we go. So you can see it's solar powered. It has little solar panels on it and it fits a bit like a rucksack, a backpack. And the straps of this backpack are made from... How big was the nest wood? Probably about that size. Put some big branches up there, some big, you know, some big, quite thick, they've been carrying big, thick branches like this. Wow. Fraser telling me about the nest. Fantastic. You ever see them carrying big sticks? So, about four foot, five foot wide, the nest. Too big. But yeah, these straps um, will sit over the limb of the wing if you want the shoulder, like a backpack, like I've said. But the strap is made from uh, like a Teflon tape. 
It's of a it's a NASA spec. Yeah, it's going fine. Teflon tape, extremely expensive. Yeah. Strong and just hold it and as you like, stronger than anything. Or any Give particular it. substitute you can think of. Give it at least and also with a guarantee that it just simply won't fray. You can't damage this this tape. Sewn together by cotton. You saw Ian there sewing it together. That cotton degrades in about five years, and then the whole thing falls away naturally. By that point, we'll know where Thelma resides. Now here's me putting on a bit of super glue to seal off that Teflon tape with a cut mark, just to make absolutely sure there's no fraying. So forming a bond, if you will, and uh, Fraser blowing it dry. So I believe that's Louise now. She's finished. She's in a bag, ready to go. There she is. And we're just doing the last few jobs now with Thelma. Is at this point, I believe, that Fraser returns up the tree to receive these two eagles again. There it goes. And this time you may notice he has a blue carrier bag there. And uh, in there, I believe, if my memory serves me right, you know, it's either two hare or two rabbits. And that's to leave on the nest with the chicks when they return. So there's some food for the parents. My moment with Thelma. I could feel her warmth. I could feel her heartbeat. And I'm not ashamed to say, and I don't quite know how I film the next bit, uh, because just about now, I get incredibly teary. Um, it's like I've created an immediate, an incredibly strong bond with this bird. Um, And do you know what? When I watched her go back up that tree in that in that uh, bag there, because I was privy to the politics of the Scottish Highlands and raptor control, I, I truly hoped that this would be the last time she would come face to face, and that I would possibly be the last human that she would come in contact with. I crossed my fingers. I hoped with all of my heart. That would be the case. So there you go, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I hope you could hear me through my huskiness. Um, so there is a very loaded part of today's vlog in the respect that, and you know that I alluded to you that when I used Thelma in the past tense in the introduction, um, so Thelma fledged, um, in fact, as much as we thought that she wouldn't appear on camera again, she did, bless her, because on fledging, um, she decided to get a little bit more adventurous than possibly she should do. Um, she flew directly east on one day and didn't stop. She kept going until she hit the east coast. And they know this because they followed her on her tag. Um, she didn't eat, she didn't drink, um, she decided she didn't particularly like the East Coast and then she decided to fly directly back again west. Sadly, with no food or water, not being in a position really to manage herself properly, she'd only just fledged, um, she collapsed. Um, thankfully again though, um, she ended up, I believe, incredibly, back in the fringes of Abernethy Reserve where she was picked up pretty quickly thanks to obviously positioning from her tag. And she was then taken to, and this is the best bit, she was then taken to a rehab centre in Scotland, um, a veterinary centre and at that time purely coincidentally 
At that time, the BBC were there filming a series called Call of the Wild, which is all about this particular centre and their abilities to rehab wildlife. So upturned Thelma. So they didn't call her Thelma per se. Um, she was just a um, white-tailed eagle, a female white-tailed eagle, a chick, a juvenile, obviously. And uh, and they didn't really even allude to the uh, the geotag on her. Um, they showed her being re rehabilitated. Um, there was a bit of jeopardy, as there always is in these programs. Will she? Won't she make it? Um, I'm glad to say she did. And then they filmed her release. Now, funnily enough, Fraser, you saw in that film, had sent me his own iPhone video of her release, her second release, because he told me about this this flight east she'd had, only to return west and then collapse. Um, so it was a great day when I received that video. And it just by chance, uh, I was watching this Call of the Wild program on iPlayer because I'd heard it got a white tail eagle on it. And I suddenly realised when they started to show the release site that it was the same place uh, and the same film, the same spot and occasion as Fraser's uh, film upload that he'd sent me. So I realised this was absolutely Thelma. In fact, let's just show you a clip of it now. I've managed to locate this little clip of Thelma's release um, on national TV. So let's just enjoy that moment now. Wonderful, I'm sure you'll agree, to see her flying, uh, to see her in all her glory. Obviously, she wasn't in a position to fly. When we were there ringing her, she was too young. So lovely to see her in that aspect. Well, I'm glad to say that she continued with her life in a relatively normal way from that point onwards. Um, they were tracking her over the next few months, out of 2018 into 2019, over the winter and into the spring and she was doing pretty much everything you'd expect of a white-tailed sea eagle in their first year not necessarily going too far but you know a fair old range a fair old range from the nest site then now this is news that we've only just recently had but it actually happened on july the 22nd on july the 22nd thelma managed to fly over Inverness Grouse Moor, uh, a driven Grouse Moor. Um, and all of a sudden, her tag stopped. There was no signal on her tag at all. The alarm was raised, as, as happens when these, these tags stop. And I don't know how quickly um, representatives of Thelma um, got to the spot where she was last seen. Um, but when they did arrive there, there was no trace of her or her tag. The RSPB immediately decided to start an investigation. Um, more so, I expect, uh, because apparently the place, the site at which she disappeared, other very large raptors had disappeared in the nearby vicinity uh, too, um, at quite a frequency over the years. I'm imagining because of the duration of this investigation, this wasn't released, this information about Thelma going missing wasn't released until November the 4th of last year, 2019. And that's when I, I first heard about it. Uh, it was just labeled as a um, tagged Invernessia white-tailed eagle. Now, I can tell you that that pair of eagles in Abernethy Forest, the, the parent pair, are very unusual because of their inland location, the Invernessia location. Incredibly unusual, um, nationally, internationally unusual, because um, despite being sea eagles, that's what white tails are. They were feeding their chicks solely on hair, predominantly brown hair, as well as the occasional gull and corvid. Uh, which was almost unheard of. Um, so that rang alarm bells because when I read this about this Invernessia bird, it, it, it said immediately to me, this could only be of that family group. I contacted Ian. He wasn't sure whether it was Thelma. 
he then contacted some other people and sadly it was confirmed quite shortly with me that it was actually Thelma. Thelma all of a sudden going missing over a driven grouse moor on July the 22nd 2019. Now by the time of the press release November the 4th the RSPB had, had a lot of time obviously to carry out their investigation and to assess the data. And the data is quite important because when tags fail apparently they leave a fingerprint, um, a digital fingerprint. If it was a natural fail, an electrical fail of a tag, you can kind of see by the sequence of events uh, in the data that's sent and not sent um, that it is an electrical fail. It has its own unique kind of identifier, a uh, fingerprint. There is also unique identifiers for those tags that are stopped from an outside element, possibly by a third party, um, cease to exist or operate um, through no fault of their own, but by something else. They too also leave a unique identifier in the data they send and don't send, almost like a fingerprint. To all intents and purposes, the data apparently received from Thalmas Tag in those last few moments um, was that of something um, getting itself involved with Thelma and her tag. I'm not going to beat around the bush anymore. <laughs> we all pretty much know those in the know what's gone on here and that's the fact that Thelma has been killed most probably most definitely over a driven grouse moor because of the driven grouse moor. A driven grouse moor is basically in short, and I want to simplify everything here, a grouse farm. Uh, a farm for grouse to then be shot um, by the very wealthy as part of their sport, their folly. The densities of grouse on these pieces, these tracts of land, these massive tracts of land that cover a great, ma a great big part of Scotland's islands um, is silly. Uh, a natural density would be a microcosm of the actual densities you're finding red grouse on these pieces of land and they manage that they manage to to get such huge numbers of these grouse by very very carefully managing the ground basically creating a monoculture they create an environment where there is the grouse and everything the grouse requires and that's pretty much just heather so you end up with this almost monoculture of one bird and one plant food source and nothing else and they ensure there's nothing else because they tend to remove it with vigor um, it's a high earning sport um, it's a high paying dividend for the gamekeepers that manage these pieces of ground because the very wealthy expect to get a large amount of grouse on their day or weekend out shooting. The last thing any one of these wealthy shooters wants to see is any form of predator. Uh, any form of predator would suggest that possibly their bag um, of grouse at the end of the day is not going to be what it should have been because predators, natural predators, are getting in the way. So they remove them. There are no stoat weasel there are no fox, there's certainly no smaller birds of prey, famously hen harriers have been cleaned off the map pretty much in Scotland, and nor do they like eagles. Several golden eagles going missing, several white-tailed eagles going missing, and I think importantly we must remember the date here, July the 22nd when Thelma disappeared, and that would only be three, three and a half weeks from as they call it uh, the glorious 12th the first day of the shooting season one of the biggest days of the shooting season so i'd imagine that any gamekeeper working this this northern monlith mountain in venetia grouse moor would be very much about their game at that point in time absolutely making sure that their piece of land was pristine 
in the respect that it only had a huge population of grouse ready to be shot and good healthy heather and not a raptor or predator in sight. That's pretty much what happened. There will people there will be people that say this is supposition. I say they know they're lying. Um, we tend to rely on data. When I say we, I mean naturalists and conservationists that have been following this this problem, uh, this slight on our natural heritage for many years. And anybody that defies the mass, the wealth of data and information and evidence, damning evidence that this is happening, well, they're just liars. I'm not going to dress it up. So, at this point, I could tell you, um, I give you countless uh, URLs or, or websites for the campaign against driven grouse moors. I won't just do that today because I think I don't want to overawe you, um, but I'll be addressing uh, this again in future vlogs at some point. Please do take yourself out now and investigate this topic if you've not heard about it before, because there is a mass slaughter going on of our natural heritage up there in the Highlands and all in the name of a few wealthy people who like to shoot grouse. I'll leave that there now with you. I want there to be a legacy for Thelma, so I'm promising you there will be plenty of time for us to mount up a challenge, as lots of people are, to this, this horrendous pastime. What I do like, or what I like to think about Thelma, is the fact that, for once, when we're getting a piece of, of news about a raptor, another raptor going missing up in the islands. For once, we have an actual bird viscerally there on your screen. You can look into her eyes. I can tell you my personal account of her, her warmth, her heartbeat. I felt them. She's real. She's an individual. We have her now as a real eagle, uh, identifiable eagle against this terrible headline. That makes her very powerful, I believe. And I'm hoping that Thelma leaves a legacy way and beyond anything she could have thought of. And that her loss isn't really going to be a loss in the long run. Because hopefully the power of her and the influence of her will quicken the challenge to stop what I believe is something that's in its death knell anyway. And that's the sport of driven grass shooting. Well, you'll know that in the next time clips for the previous vlogs, I've shown you an Amazon delivery man at my door delivering something. Um, I then failed to address that in last week's vlog. Apologies. I can tell you it was an amazing piece of equipment and it was something I've been waiting for as a filmmaker for about a year and a half. So, Forgive me, bear with me one second. This, hopefully you can see that in the light there. It's a DJI Ronan. This is the Ronan S. Calling it her already. I promise I won't do that again. And the Ronan is a handheld gimbal. Um, a beautiful piece of equipment where the camera that's filming me right now, uh, the GH5, will be attached to this um, on future ventures uh, and it will afford me, hopefully, some wonderful cinematic footage of which we can all enjoy. Um, brilliant piece of equipment, so pleased to have it. Really will up the game in my filmmaking and I really hope uh, we get to see some clips very soon I'm thinking probably in the next couple of weeks at least if I just power it on it's still relatively new there we go and we should see it bounce into life obviously without the camera there we go it's an incredible piece of equipment and uh, 
really looking forward to using it. So uh, that was the mystery package, the DJI Ronin S. Well, guys, thanks for joining me for vlog 11. It's been a very powerful vlog. It's been one I've wanted to do for a very long time. Um, I hope that you will join in with me uh, to create some kind of legacy for Thelma. Um, I hope that she's touched your hearts, if only in a small way, as much as she's touched mine, because that should easily be enough for us then to muster ourselves in the forthcoming years to make sure we can wipe out this disgusting sport of driven grass shooting. That's it for Vlog 11, guys. Looking forward to Vlog 12. But in the meantime, just leaves me to say goodbye.